Easter is April 5th and plans are underway for an incredible day of worship. For the first time ever, we'll have four services in our worship center at 7, 8.30, 10, and 11.30, with additional services at 9.30 and 11.11 in Hudson Hall. That's six total worship opportunities here on the Brentwood campus. If you're a regular attender, please consider the earliest and the latest of these options to make more room for our guests during peak hours. And as usual, we ask that you take advantage of our off-site parking and shuttle service to and from the front door to free up more parking space for our guests. Remember, there are no adult, student, or children's life groups meeting that day, but we will have life groups for preschool birth through age four throughout the entire morning. Easter is a great day to invite those in your circle of influence to join you for worship. And to make that easier, we've created a special webpage, BrentwoodEaster.com, geared specifically toward guests. This page provides an easy way to view all of our campuses along with directions, service times, and other details with links back to each campus website to learn more. You can also visit our regular website to learn more about other Holy Week activities like the Living Last Supper at the Station Hill campus or Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday's Praying the Seven Stations of the Cross, both on the Brentwood campus. Again, that's April 5th, Easter at Brentwood Baptist Church. Students, everybody goes to camp. Registration is open right now for all of our summer 2015 events, including Beach Camp. It's June 19th through the 23rd in beautiful Panama City Beach, Florida. We've got mission trips to Vancouver, Chicago, as well as right here in Middle Tennessee. There's no better time to consider the call of Christ to be alive and free. So head on over to your campus website today for details and to sign up now. We'll see you this summer. This summer, journey off the map with Vacation Bible School at Brentwood Baptist in each of its regional campuses here in Middle Tennessee. The Vacation Bible School journey starts on June 8th at the Brentwood campus. It's a new time and a brand new adventure that kicks off three straight weeks of VBS, including June 15th at the church at West Franklin and June 22nd at the church at Station Hill. Then add to that Backyard Kids Clubs in the Woodbine, Avenue South, and our local communities and more, and you've got a true adventure that children and families will never forget. Christ. Want to be a trail guide on the journey? Volunteer registration is open now. Just head to BrentwoodBaptist.com slash VBS to sign up today. Journey off the map with Vacation Bible School, coming in June 2015. Sending a card to someone in need can be a great way to reach out to others. Last year, members of our Nurture Teens card ministry sent out over 7,800 notes of encouragement to members of our church and community during times of illness, difficulty, or loss. You can help make a difference in people's lives with a simple card of blessing and hope. Join our card ministry, one of the many ways our Nurture Team cares for others. Hi, I'm Michelle Dyer, the Place Ministry Coordinator at Brentwood Baptist, where I have the privilege of helping people discover their unique design and purpose to engage in ministry on each of our campuses. We want to welcome you to worship this morning. If you're a first time guest, we'd love to have a record of your visit by filling out a communication card. These are in the pew racks in front of you or in the bulletin if you're worshiping in Hudson Hall. You can use this card to update your contact information or submit a prayer request so we can be praying for you. Just drop it in the offering a little later in the service. We're so glad you're here. Now, let's worship together. 
Good morning. I'm so glad to welcome uh, as our guest worship leader this morning, Tommy Walker. You can read more about Tommy in the bulletin, and he has CDs out there with his songs. We've sung his songs here in worship. He's uh, served for the past 25 years as a worship pastor in a church in Southern California. He happened to be in town doing some writing and other things with Lifeway, and we're just thrilled to welcome him. So right now, would you stand, take a minute, and greet a few people around you, and then remain standing as Tommy leads us.
great Easter verse right here. Everybody. Or oh, crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed for the grave, who rose victorious above the sky. sing. That's why we praise Him. Oh, that's why we sing. That's why we offer Him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this King. Because He gave His everything. Because He gave Everybody's singing, that's why we praise him. Oh, that's why we. 
word the Bible gives us when we're so blessed we don't know what else to say. I've had the privilege of traveling to a lot of places and I'm not very good with languages but I know this one in every language. Sing with me like this. Thank you, God, for this beautiful day you've given us. It's the day that you made that we could rejoice and be glad. There's never been a day like it before or after. We come to give you our praise, our honor and glory. And everybody said, amen. amen. You can be seated. I was just thinking this morning um, how really we're joining with millions upon millions upon millions of people that agree with us today that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And my church, Christian Assembly in Los Angeles, sends their greetings and they're getting ready to start worshiping because it's earlier there. So don't you feel sorry for me? Right? <laughs> but we are a part of a big family, a kingdom that will have no end. It's a blessing. We're going to do a song from Psalms 116. just says, I love the Lord. He heard my cry. I love the Lord. He heard my voice. He heard my cry. He turned his ear when I called.
pray one more time. God, there is no one like you. Who in all the skies above can compare with you? There is none. There is none. Help us be the kind of people that give you the kind of praise that a God like you would deserve, Lord. We thank you for the promise and evidence of your presence in this place. And everybody said, amen. You can be seated. heaven songs and um, this one says someday we will lay all our burdens down and uh, there's no other comfort and hope like the hope of heaven and I keep finding out the older I get the more hope I have <laughs> and someday Be 
done And we'll lay our heavy burdens down When at his feet we bow At last we will be home Forever and someday It will all be over And at last, the bitter taste of death forever will give way to tears of joy and life eternal and someday. give you an opportunity now to pray if you would and the altar's open if you'd like to come and kneel our pastor's going to be here I'm going to pray for him what a privilege we have to come before the Lord and, and pour out our hearts to him however we need to do that so you're welcome to do that right now so let's pray together the Lord for he heard my voice he heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me and I will call on him as long as I live the Lord is gracious and righteous our God is full of compassion 
the Lord protects the simple hearted. When I was in great need, he saved me. Be at rest once more, O my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. Gracious Father, in this place today we proclaim to you and to one another that you have been good to us. Even in the midst of adversity and tribulation and trial and suffering, you have been faithful, Lord, over and over again. You have proven yourself to us. In, in times that we don't deserve it, Lord, you love us. You extend grace and mercy and forgiveness, and we're so thankful for that, Father. We thank you for the way that you're speaking to us, Lord, in this place this morning. And we pray that we would have ears to hear and hearts to receive. And I pray that as we leave this place in a little while, Lord, that your word will have been boldly proclaimed and received. And we will walk from this place to be everything you've called us to be, Lord, in the world around us. So thank you. Thank you so much for the freedom and privilege to be in this place to worship you. And thank you for hearing the prayers of your people. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray them. Amen. I always leave these little booby traps around for me, so. And you're going to be sitting out there going, I wonder if he's going to trip over it this time, so. All right, hold this thought. As our church continues to grow, as we develop more campuses and extend relationships, how do we keep the church small? How do we keep you from feeling like a number from know, and, and understand that we know you, we understand what you're going through, and we're aware of your circumstances, and, be, and we're in prayer for you? Okay, hold that thought. Hold this thought. We believe everybody is uniquely gifted by the Father for the good of his church. Uh, we believe all of you have gifts, uh, something significant to bring to the body. We believe no one has all the gifts. And it is together, in bringing the gifts together, that the Lord is magnified and his greatness shown in a way that one person cannot do by themselves. All right? We have people in our church who have the gift of compassion. They have the gift of mercy. And when you're going through hard times, those are the people you want in your life. Uh, you want them to come by and say, see, I don't have any mercy. When we do the spiritual gifts test, it looks like you colored the bottom of the graft uh, for me. It's just like the bottom line's a little thicker. That's where my mercy is. Uh, and, and when people come to me and go, hey, I need to talk to you, I tell them, hey, the Lord knew you didn't need mercy or he'd sent you somewhere else. <laughs> but, so yeah, I, I don't have that gift, but gratefully, we have lots of people in our church who do, and, and, and several of our women with these gifts have gotten together and formed the nurture team. Now, the nurture team is one of the ways that our, church is, that our church responds to you when you're going through some tough times. Let me tell you some things, and I had them write them down for me because I know I never remember all of this. Um, they sent over 460 flower arrangements out. Now, they have arrangements with local florists that if they're going to throw out flowers, they get them. And they pick up what would have been thrown away, which, and they're still beautiful, and they come and make an arrangement, and some of you have received those arrangements with a note from the nurture team. They have sent out over 525 baskets and written over 7,800 prayer cards. 308 care boxes to our military, to our men and women serving, and 118 prayer shawls. Some of you have got, I'm, I'm telling you, you need to get sick just so the nurture team can reach out to you. <laughs> is, is, is that impressive? I, I'm, I'm not... Um, and, and, and in telling you this, I, I, need to, I need to share with you a word of confession. Several years ago, a group of the ladies came to me and said, we'd like to do prayer shawls. Is that okay? Well, I looked up prayer shawls in the Bible. And there was nothing prohibiting prayer shawls. So I said, fine. But I, I'm, I'm not wired that way. So I didn't get it. I, I didn't. 
friend of mine stops me in the hall just outside the door there, pulls me aside and goes, hey, did you know the nurture team? Yeah. Yeah, I know the nurture team. Hey, they gave me a prayer shawl. They did. Yeah, let me tell you what happened. I've been going through chemo. Yeah, I know. The chemo made me really jumpy. Yeah. I couldn't sleep. Yeah. Till I got that prayer shawl. And I put that thing around me at night and I have slept every night. Tell those ladies I can sleep at night. Now that was just one story. I heard dozens. Same kind of thing. And then I began to understand the significance of what it means to put that prayer shawl around you and knowing that the lady who crocheted, who knitted that prayer shawl, prayed for you the entire time she was doing it. And it's not that you're being wrapped in a, in a ball of yarn. It's that you're being literally wrapped in prayer, literally. And it's a way that our church tells you, we're here. We know what you're going through. We're praying for you. I went back to the nurture team. I said, you guys keep on going. I had no idea. Now, in and of itself, you wouldn't think that'd be that big a deal unless you're in the hospital and everybody that has come by has poked or hurt or stuck. And then show, somebody shows up with a basket and in that basket is hand lotion and a notepad. Things that you need in the hospital but nobody thinks to bring you. And that's what this church does. That's what the nurture team does. That's one way that we just kind of remind people you're not on this journey by yourself. And they're able to respond to all of these needs and have the resources they need to do that because of your faithfulness to this moment. It's one of the ways that God blesses the people by blessing you. God's people pay for God's work. And as you're blessed and as you're successful, then you bring your tithes and your offerings and those resources are then turned into the symbols of love and the manifestations of love that our congregation and community know. So as our ushers come forward in the main sanctuary, if you join us in an overflow in Baskin Chapel, they'll be coming there as well. So let's continue our worship as we give. Lord, receive the gifts of your children, for we give them with great excitement and enthusiasm, mindful of how good you have been to us, knowing that, boy, there have been times when we had an answer before we even knew to pray. That's how much you love us. That's how closely you pay attention to us. So we pray for our brothers and sisters who will be receiving these gifts uh, from cards and baskets and prayer shawls because we know some of them will be going through life's toughest moments. And it will be a tangible way that you, sh you remind them you haven't forgotten. And we're grateful that we get to be part of that. So we look forward to how you're going to bring glory and honor to your name and make known the great name of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in your name. Amen. I guess Tommy got to figuring out how much money all that equipment cost and how close my big old flat clumsy feet were to it. And so I moved every way, moved it away. Uh, over the course of my career, I've had uh, the opportunity to meet several biblical translators. Now, I'm not talking about people who study Greek and Hebrew and then translate it to English. Uh, those are some friends of mine too. I'm talking about people who will go to different parts of the world, uh, like with Wycliffe, and embed themselves into the life of a certain people group because they will have identified a certain people group that they don't have the Bible in their language. And so they will go for years and stay with this people group, get to know their language, get to know their customs so that they can better uh, interpret the scriptures in a way that this particular people group will understand it. And, and when we talk, they'll, they'll, they'll wrinkle up their brow and say, you know, it, it's hard when you try to translate things like grace. 
how you interpret mercy, how you try to grab hold of a word that is as deep and rich as salvation is and try to help somebody understand that. How do you translate this good news of Jesus Christ to a pagan, unbelieving culture that may not even have the words for it? That's our problem, isn't it? How do you translate the good news of Jesus Christ to a postmodern, pagan, unbelieving culture that literally doesn't even have the words for it anymore? How do you help somebody to understand the good news of Jesus Christ when they don't understand good news of any kind at all? What words do you use? What Metaphors. What word pictures do you, do you use? See, this is the same problem that John had talking to his church in the early church. It was one of the issues that he was addressing in the, the book we call 1 John. We're going to read about how he answered this very same question in chapter 3, verse 16. Stand with me in honor of God's word. Let's read together. Now, this is how we have come to know love, that he laid down his life for us. Now, we should also lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need but shuts off his compassion from him, now how can God's love reside in him? Our little children, we must love in word. We must not love in word or speech, but in deed and in truth. Now, this is how we know we are of the truth. And we are convinced our hearts in his presence. But if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And we can receive whatever we ask for him because we are keeping his commands and we are doing what is pleasing in his sight. Now this is his command, that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he commanded us. Now the one who keeps his command remains in him and Christ he in him. And this is the way that we know that he remains in us from the spirit that he has given us. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Live in us, O oh Lord, that we become the walking definitions, the living illustrations of the good news that you are. And we pray this in your name. Amen. It's somewhat of, of a misunderstanding to think that 1 John is a letter. It's, it's not a letter. It doesn't have the things that we would think a letter has, such as it doesn't have a two section. When Paul writes the letter, he'll say, to the saints in Galatia, or to the saints in Rome. And we'll know the, the, the purpose of the letter, the target of the letter, the people who were going to receive the letter. And that will give us some context to understand what is written in the body of the letter. Uh, John doesn't have a two section. He doesn't have uh, an ending and greeting or encouragement section that, that a lot of the letters have. This is a sermon. And one of the reasons we know it's a sermon is that he does certain preacher tricks in the letter. Uh, things like coming back to the same uh, point again and again, but coming at it at a different way. is as if he's saying to the church, I know you think you heard me, but I'm not sure you got it. So I'm going to say it again to make sure you get it, but I'm going to say it a little differently, and I'm going to give you just a, a little different angle on how you understand it and how you apply it. But I'm going to give you the same point again and again and again. And he keeps circling back to these same handful of points. So if you're not careful, if you're just casually reading, you'll think, oh, I have already seen this. I have already heard this from him. I don't need to pay attention here. That would be a mistake. Because there's some beautiful writing here, and you can almost hear the dialogue going on between John and his congregation about what I'm trying to tell you, what it means, and how you live it out. 
So he goes and reminds them, this is how we know what we're talking about. Remember, he opened up 1 John by saying, what we have seen and heard, what we know from our life with Jesus Christ is what we are saying to you. This is how we know that we are telling you the truth. This is how we know that this is the love of God. How do we know? What is it that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us? That's what we know. That's how love is defined. That's how love has been shown to us. That those of us who were not worthy of it, who didn't earn it or deserve it, have been given the incredible gift of Christ's sacrifice in our place. Now, this image of laying down your life for each other becomes the defining illustration, the defining picture of what we know a Christian's love is all about. For instance, it's what Paul figures out and try to, un- to help us understanding about marriage. The book of Ephesians uh, is uh, Christians in Ephesus writing to Paul and saying, okay, we're Christians, now what? And the book of Ephesians is, now this is how you live the life that is worthy of the calling that you have. And this is what it means to be Christians in marriage. And the word picture he gives to us is the, is the picture of Christ's love for the church. In that passage, he says, husbands, love your wives. Now, I wanted him to put a period right there because that would be almost a Hallmark card, wouldn't it? Paul said, love your wives. But he puts this qualifier on it. He puts this clarifier on it. He, he, he gives us a way to understand it. As Christ loves the church. Uh Uh-oh. Now, the bad thing about that is, is we've already been telling our wives, listen to this man because he's brilliant, because just before that, Paul says, wives, obey your husbands. And see, he he snookers the husbands really bad in that passage. It's a classic, uh, classic bait and switch. Uh, Oh, oh, it is, because, you know, he, he jumps up and says, now, wives, obey your husband. What's every husband doing? Listen to this man. This guy's brilliant. And then, then he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, we've already told our wives this man's brilliant, and you're caught. Now, in all of our discussion about what it is to be married and what marriage means and all of that, and all our understanding about the husband is the is head of the house and husband needs to be in charge, why is it that we never have a debate about who this church belongs to? We've never had a discussion about who owns this church. All of us know Jesus owns this church. This is his body. This is his place. This is his. We don't debate that. Why? Because we've never had anybody love us like Jesus does. And when you think about his death on the cross, that ends all discussion. Nobody comes close to that. That's what we're responding to. And husbands, when you lay down your life for your wife as Christ did for the church, the issue of authority never comes up. She just simply knows there's never been anybody love me like that. So when Paul wanted you to understand what it is to be married, he gave us this picture of a love that gives itself up. For the sake of the beloved. This is what we know. This is how we've seen it. And because this is what Jesus lived out for us, this is the way we live it out for each other. In the first chapter of John's gospel, he tells us that the Word was with God and the Word was God. The the Logos, the great Logos hymn. The word Logos can be interpreted word or meaning. The meaning was with God. The meaning was God. In in verse 14 of that same chapter, John tells us that the word, the meaning, became flesh. The great teaching of the incarnation, that God came into our life. Hebrews tells us that we can approach the throne of grace boldly because we have in our high priest someone who knows what it is to be human. Who knows how hard it is so we can approach boldly understanding that we don't have to explain everything to him. He gets it. Because God came in human flesh, everything that he wanted to say is said in the life of Jesus Christ. If you want to know something about the Father, look at Jesus' life. If you want to know what truth is, look at Jesus' life. 
If you want to know what is real, what is not, look at Jesus' life. If you want to know what matters and what doesn't, look at Jesus' life. Everything God wants to say is in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why the call to discipleship is come follow, not come know about. The measure of a disciple isn't how much you know, it's how close you are. How close you are walking with Christ. That's the call. What we see in him, what we watch in him, what we have confirmed in his life, we now live out in our life. This is the way that the gospel is translated to a world that doesn't have words to understand what the good news of Jesus Christ is. It's lived out in you and me. We live it out for our brothers and our sisters. We love each other. That's why gossip is so bad. Because when you show up to work or somewhere where unbelievers are and you talk about another Christian, what the unbeliever is saying, wow, that's the way they talk about their friends. If they knew what I am, if they knew what I've done, what in the world would they say about me? I don't need to go there. That's why, that's why it's so bad. Because it hurts the, the witness of the body. We love each other. And we love each other for a couple of reasons. One, we, know we love each other because it's what the Father told us to do. We love each other because the, the, the presence of God is overwhelming us, and we've got to give away some of this love or drown. Okay, we're, we're like a kid that's inherited a, a, a candy store. Okay, we didn't buy any of the candy. It didn't cost us anything, and we've got more candy than we'll ever eat. And so we show up the first day, and what do you do if you're a kid in the candy store? What do you do the first day in the candy store? You eat everything in the store. And if anybody was to walk by, they'd just see your little cheeks all puffed out, little paper crap around, all, all around your feet, you know, and you would eat to what? Till you got sick of it. Till you got sick. Then what do you do? You try to give it away. Here, have some candy. Have some candy. Have some candy. Eat, eat the chocolate. Eat the uh, wine. I can't eat anymore. That's the life of a believer. We have been saturated with the love of Christ. Oh, we can't stand anymore. We're drowning in it. Here, take some love of God. Why? I, I can't carry anymore. I've had all I can take. I have to love you or drown. I have to give it away because it's overrunning my little life. And that's the way we know. We know because it's the way that we love a brother, because that's not the language of our world. Our language is if you see somebody weak, destroy them. If you see somebody that can't hold on to it, take what they have. That's the language of our world. Yesterday I'm watching the basketball, and this guy makes a great play. It's, a, it's an amazing play. So we got to watch it 48 times in slow motion. And so, you know, they're showing me it. But, but what, they really, what they really show is, is that the guy, he slams it. Bam! And he's it's there, and, and he, when he lands on his feet, he stares down the guy that tried to block his shot. He just gives him, you know. And the, and the commentators were going, oh, there's a competitor. That, that would have been a technical foul in my day. Okay, when I was, when I was playing ball, oh, I would still be running laps for a first one. But that, oh, you say, that's, it, that's it. You dominate. You own him. That's the language of our world. And what the Christian says to the world is, you can't own me. I've already been bought and paid for. And what you're trying to get is way cheap for what's been offered for me. And when somebody walks in and they say, you don't know me, you don't know who I am, you don't know what I've been through, we say, that's right, we don't. But we know something about you you don't know. What? We've been told you bear the image of God. And somewhere under all of that mess, somewhere under all that filth, somewhere under all that guilt and bad decisions is something that reflects to us the very being and nature of God. And if we can help you sweep away from that, we're going to find something incredible and beautiful. We understand, we understand that you are so important and so valuable that Jesus Christ died for you. And that's the great thing about being in a church. We get to walk with somebody, and we get to see those layers of mistakes fall away, and we get to watch forgiveness, watch that away. And then all of a sudden, it will break open and be beautiful, and they will say, I never knew. No, 
The world doesn't know this. It's God and his people who do. You see, if you see somebody in need and you don't help, you don't know Jesus. Now, oh, Mike, that's hard. I didn't write this. I would have written something different if you're pretty good to people. Close enough for me. But that's not. Love seeks the best. I'm going to seek the best for this person. And that's how I know. Now, John gives us an interesting warning about conscience. Be careful of your conscience. Why? We train our conscience. We do. We tell it what to pay attention to, what not to pay attention to, what to warn us about and what not to. Okay? Uh, when Gene and I were first married and we were still in seminary, uh, we had an apartment right next to a train track. Now, you're saying, now you're thinking Mike is saying that the apartment was near a train track. No. I'm saying to you that you, pull, you pulled across the train track into the parking place in front of our, dry, our, our apartment. Okay? Apartment, parking place, train. Now, the first six months we were in that apartment, we found out why it was so cheap. You can't sleep. And if, and if somehow if the engineer saw the light on your apartment, he wanted to say hi, so he blew his horn. I mean, I mean, dishes would bounce on the table. You'd rattle it around, and it's it just, well, after five or six months, it didn't bother us. And our friends would be over, and all of a sudden, they'd jump up and go, what, what is that? What's what? <laughs> that noise. Oh, that's a train. See, we had learned not to pay attention to it. And sometimes you get in a situation, and your conscience will tell you, uh-uh. And you can explain to your conscience, you don't understand. This is not that big a deal. This is not that bad of a problem. I can handle this. After all, it's just one Oreo. Right? I've eaten more Oreos in my history. I didn't do too bad. And you will explain your conscience away. And then you'll end up in a situation where it will fall down on you and you will say, I don't know how I got here. Because you have told your conscience to be quiet and you have trained your conscience. Now, on the flip side, you can hyper train your conscience. And Baptists are really good at this. You know, if we're laughing and have a good time, we assume that's sin. Oh, this can't be God's will. We're having way too much fun. We need to confess something. I don't know. Somebody pray. Somebody do something. We're... <laughs> so, and so we'll get so messed up that we can't even enjoy the good things of life because we feel guilty. Oh, this is, I, mean, I have a friend. He's incredibly gifted. Incredibly. When, when he plays, people stop. People wipe tears from their eyes. It's amazing. The only one who doesn't love the performance is him. And I go up to him and say, that was amazing. No, no. And then he'll tell me some obscure point. You know, the third bar, the second, yeah, we missed it. And I want to say, yeah, I got that. But, <laughs> but over the years, he's been told it's not good enough. It's never good enough. So he trained his conscience. It's not good enough. It'll never be right. It never, it's never good enough. And so no matter how beautifully he plays, he's never good enough. So finally I told him, I said, don't you understand that Jesus gave you this gift for the two of you to enjoy it together? That Jesus is the author of music, the creator of music, and he gave you this so the two of you could talk to each other? <laughs> don't you understand that it's just you and him? And he loves what you play because he loves you. There are times when you do what you do. And you do it because it's who you are. And it's out of the gift that you have to do that. And in that, somebody will be touched be transformed, will be thinking a different way about Jesus and his love for them. That's because of the way that you are created. This is how you know you stay connected. Did you see that? 
Did you see that? This is what we ask. This is how we know if you, Jesus is Lord and you abide in him. You keep his commandments. And when you keep his commandments, you stay connected to him. In John 15, Jesus teaches about the vine. You can't do anything if you're disconnected. Now, he didn't say you can't do most things or you'll do badly. He said you can't do anything. And that's why some of you struggle so much with your discipleship because you're trying to do it, do it with your own power. Okay? You've made, it, you've made a New Year's resolution. I'm going to be kinder to people. And that lasted until you got on the interstate. <laughs> and then somebody cut over on you with no blinker and, and you were not moved to pray for him. <laughs> in fact, you want to be called as a witness on Judgment Day so you can make sure he burns in hell. Right? <laughs> this is the guy. Because you couldn't do it in your own strength. But when you stay connected, when you abide, when you stay in worship, when you stay in Bible study, and when your life is aligned, see, that, that's what he says. And you can pray and you'll get what you ask for when you pray because your life is lined up and there's nothing to kink that pipe of grace and mercy and love that wants to flow through you. When all that happens, because you stay connected, you abide. You can't do it by yourself. But if Christ is in you, you can't do anything else. This is how we know. This is how you know. This is how we know you know. Because you know that Jesus is Lord. And you love each other. And you can't do either without loving Jesus most. Amen. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, just think about your own life in this moment. I, for some of you, it has been hard to do what you know to do. Because you try to do it in your own strength, your own power. And you realize something's happened. Life's been tough, you know, hard decisions, and you have become disconnected. Maybe this is a time of confession and realignment and just getting connected again. Or maybe it's the first time you have thought about it. this is the time for you to sit and just know that Christ loves you and now invites you to love him back. And that begins my understanding of what you have broken you cannot fix. That the mistakes you made that Jesus has paid for and in his death he carried all your guilt. In his resurrection he invites you to a new life. And I know I've said a whole lot in just a few words, but our ministers, our counselors are waiting out just outside the door. You'll see a sign that says next. Go to that, go to that sign and just say, hey, I, I want to know more about Jesus Christ. Maybe you want to become part of the church family, whatever it is. The Lord Jesus himself is waiting for you where you are. The church waits for you as you come. And Lord Jesus, every life is now open, every heart. So we pray. We pray the choices and decisions we make are exactly what you want. And we pray this in your name.
bless you. You are dismissed. Have a great day.